Hi everyone, I'm Summer. I'm Carrie. And this is Alexia Podcast. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous, be fine. Fuck. <laughs> oh my god! What the hell just happened? <laughs> what the hell? What is happening? <laughs> um, make sure you come back. We're gonna do this bi-weekly. So make sure you come back to talk to, to us more about you know, sex, drugs, and self-improvement. <laughs> this is Josh. She's part of my chosen family. Uh, and then Carrie. Uh, somehow I became Carrie's mom. I'm not sure what that makes the two of you, but family. Cousin? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, see, I took Carrie to, um, the hospital when she had surgery and the nurse asked if I was her mom. <laughs> so, that made you feel good, didn't it? Great. I felt wonderful. She went, <laughs> Although, technically, um, no. <laughs> I, technically I am almost old enough to be her mom. I'm like, what is it? 13 years older, but yeah. still, I didn't need to be reminded that day. <laughs> I mean, my actual mom is only 19 years older than me, so I'm pretty close. Right. I mean, you're definitely closer in age to my kid than to me. <laughs> I just met you first. So, there is that. <laughs> All right. So Josh had contacted me. We were talking. Um, he watched our Exvangelical series. And, Love that. And, he, and said he can relate. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you, Josh. I love you for being willing to talk about this because I have to say the most feedback that we've gotten has been about those shows. And there's a lot of people who are finding them very relatable and are kind of having that same moment um, that I had when I watched like um, the Fundy Fridays channel. Like, it's not just me. I didn't make this shit up in my head. It really is that crazy. Yeah. It's... <laughs> so, so thank you for being willing to come and talk about your your experience too. We appreciate that. Absolutely. So, how would you describe your ch uh, childhood? And I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm trying not to ask <laughs> anything too specific. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, whenever my mom and stepdad got together we went completely like moved out into the country, um, did homeschooling. It, as far as the religious aspect of it, it was every Sunday morning. We didn't really do the Wednesday night thing because we kept a farm going and, um, it was enough to the point where we, didn't have Disney movies because they weren't Christian. That makes me really upset. Bad. That's right. It was your house that I learned about Veggie Tales. Yep. Oh, Veggie Tales. That is where I learned Veggie Tales. In fact, for years I had a, a whole box of old VHS tapes that they had passed down to me for the kids. That was all of my my children's Sundays. You're school. welcome. <laughs> I mean, that, for me, Veggie Tales is one of the few positive uh, experiences with related to uh, the religion. And I sometimes still sing the songs and my kids look at me like I'm crazy, but because they don't know them. Yes, the hairbrush <laughs> song. My mom still sings that song. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, we had uh, our town that I grew up in is actually... I don't know if it still is, but it was in the World Book of Records for the most churches per capita. That's is it in the world? It, in the world. <laughs> I mean, I believe it because there were a lot of them, but yeah. I never thought about it being like a record. That's yeah. like the record to get. Like it can be <laughs> the world's largest ketchup bottle or something. Which is interesting because it was it's yeah it's not that big so what happened i wonder they just couldn't get along and agree so they just kept splitting 
Pretty much. Yeah, there was um, racial divides. There was, you know, belief divides. And just there was one on almost every street corner. We kind of bounced around between Pentecostal, Baptist, Southern Baptist, that that realm, that side of it. Me too. And it wasn't just the churches. I seem to remember visiting a home church once while I was there. So they probably aren't oh, yeah. even included in those numbers. Oh, yeah. Um, for several years, we also went to the uh, Creek Indian Church. And we were the only people that weren't Creek Indians. Did nice. they um, did they do any of the service in Muskogee? In their language? Um, not really, no. no. Okay. Just um, wondering, because some of our Choctaw churches still do, so I didn't know. We what did they go up to a do. few churches north of Tulsa and to like the Muskogee churches every now and then, but. I went to Kuli Tuklo for a little bit, um, and they did a lot of it in Chata, so. <laughs> that thing, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my area of the world. I, I have made quite a few relatives angry lately <laughs> for my statements about mission work being colonization. Oh, yeah, it totally is. Um, Absolutely. We'd been, we'd been to all those church tent turn and burn summer things. We'd been to the all the prophets and prophetesses that would come around. And yeah, it it is. That's That's exactly what it is. And see, that's the thing that gets me is a lot of people like, you know, they'll show those things on TV, you know, they'll, you know, show a tent revival or, you know, you've got the evangelists or the, you know, the people billing themselves as prophets or whatever. And they like to treat it like it's this w rare thing, you know, and they make it, you know, kind of mock it and stuff, which it's, don't get me wrong, it's perfectly mockable and should be mocked. But it is so common. It is not this fringe thing. And I need people to understand that the reason we're in the situation we're in, in this country, in a lot of ways, is because we're pretending this stuff is way off on the edges. And it's actually pretty mainstream. Oh, yeah. There's There was a time in early Christianity where they were you know, Nero and that, that time frame where Christianity, none of the Christians will teach you about it, where Christians were persecuting other religions and peoples and cultures to spread the, spread what they were doing. And I actually enjoy reading about that part of the history because I never knew it while I was in it. <laughs> right. And that's something that's been a topic of conversation the last week since the Pope made his apology and that whole nonsense, um, which um, my apologize. official stance, <laughs> right. My official stance for those who haven't heard it yet is apologies mean nothing without changed behavior. So get your churches the fuck off our land and then we can talk. Yep. Um, but a lot of people didn't under, don't actually understand that that's what the doctrine of discovery is. It gives them, carte blanche to you and actually orders them <laughs> but you know god dictated that you are to subjugate these peoples and to spread christianity and yeah a lot of a lot of churches like to pretend that that's not the case yeah they think it's more like polite asking when it's more like <laughs> or we're gonna like burn you at this or something no. Well, and to be honest, I, the polite asking, I, I don't think the missions are okay anyway, even if it is politely. <laughs> I, I don't think changing form and doing it more politely makes genocide any better. But It definitely does not. It, <laughs> polite genocide doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> polite. God. 
<laughs> polite genocide. That's I'm going to put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> I'm not here for the polite genocide. Um, I'd buy that. <laughs> I keep I keep promising I'm going to make merch and I haven't done it yet. I'm sorry, everybody who's asked about it. Um, <laughs> I'm just not a graphic I'll, designer, so I suck at it. I'll work on it. Let's okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I've been out. I've, I've been out roaming Europe instead of uh, doing my job. So, <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I've ta I've never taken a, an extended vacation. I know I took like, almost three weeks off, and and actually went on a real vacation. So I feel like this is my first time recording because we haven't sat here in front of these cameras since May, June, beginning of June? Uh, like the beginning of June. Yeah. Wow. It's been a minute. I'm gonna have to relearn how to edit video. It's gonna be great. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Um, let's see, so, um, So um, at what point did you, I guess, start questioning and actually, you know, because usually it's a process to leave. It's not, most of us don't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I have a great idea. So <laughs> how did that process happen for you? Um, so there was kind of a trigger point whenever I was about 14, 15, and it caused kind of a a big explosion in my immediate family and eventually it led to um, whenever my parents got a job offer to move to New York for work um, I got to move in with my grandmother she while she was raised in that environment of you know middle of not a whole lot Oklahoma she didn't necessarily subscribe to all the religious practices and everything. So that kind of started my, I mean, the, the trigger point was the start of my tipping point to get away from it all. But seeing her living a life without it completely engulfed every aspect of what she did. Um, it really helped a lot in me starting down the path to, not being brainwashed anymore. How did that process go? Like, What's that? I said, how did that process go? Like, was there anything that you, I don't know how to word what I'm trying to say. Oh no. Was there anything that like helped on like the journey? Like besides like seeing her live like that? Um, seeing her living like that was probably like the first realization that I had that people could live without religion and be happy and everything like that. Um, so then it was, I joined the military whenever I was 19 and not a lot of military members are devout. <laughs> and even the ones that are on the religious side don't usually behave like the people that I grew up around. So um, going to, you know, living overseas for 11 years and being around different people from different walks, different religions, races, cultures, everything, um, that really opened up my eyes to what the possibilities in life were. And it probably took till about last year, maybe the year before, for me to kind of embrace and actually tell myself, like, no, you're not evangelical Christian. No, you're not even really Christian. Like, there are some parts of his history in the Bible that, like, you know, every every recorded religion has a, a great flood, so you know, there's some commonalities that you can't ignore, but at the same time, I don't really subscribe to that anymore. Yeah, it's hard to know, like, which one could be, like, telling the truth, or if it was just something, yeah. and they made it into something. It was really freeing to me once I really 
became okay with not knowing and not having to know quote unquote the truth, you know? Exactly. It's okay. These, you know, these ideas can serve a function without having to be everything. Um, and your grandmother had a big <laughs> part of my journey too, you know. I <laughs> I got absorbed into their family when I was 17, you know. I moved out of my um, parents' house at 17 and was on my own. And I happened to meet his aunt in um, one of my classes. And somehow we ended up moving in together. And I don't know, I just kind of got absorbed in. But... I remember that being talking to Corey, who has been um, a guest at one point too, um, and Pam, her mom, was the first time that I ever heard of the idea that you can raise perfectly functional adults without beating them. Because we were told you couldn't. Yeah. Like we were literally told you couldn't do it. You know, it wasn't just the quoting the spare of the rod, you know, it was you hate your kid if you don't beat them, you know? Yep. And that was the fir- my first experience with wait, wait, what? You, you don't have to? <laughs> so, yeah, that was a big. And then, so, like you said, being around different kinds of people. That that's a pretty stiff realization that I actually came to a month or two ago. I was being considerate towards my partner and writing some of my family history to kind of paint a picture about where I came from and who I was for her. And I got to that point in the story about my childhood and you know, I've always told myself in my head I was a bad kid. And a large part of that was the amount of discipline that I received as a kid. And I'm not saying I was a good kid by any means, but <laughs> being told you're a bad kid is a completely different, different thing. And I was, I don't know how my writing style got there, but I was listing all the things that I had been beaten with. And I came to this sudden moment of clarity that, oh my God, I was abused. Like whenever your list has to include like water hoses, bailing wire and the flat side of a machete, that's use. And so it was like eye opening that I had always thought that it was strict, stern and loving, but it did. It broke that line of abuse and it took me almost 32 years of life to realize it. I think that's something a lot of people don't realize because they are still stuck in that mindset of like, my parents do this because they love me and I'm a bad kid. And I think a lot of times it takes like something like that or talking to somebody else to figure out like, no, that's not like a normal like childhood thing that everybody does. Like, so I mean, I'm glad that you can like start processing that at least, you know. And that's part of the problem with how insular the evangelical community is because you're encouraged. <laughs> they like to make this false delineation between the churches and cults, you know, <laughs> but really it's just a matter of degrees and the line is arbitrary. Because they think, well, we don't force people to eliminate people from their life that aren't believers. But it, it's definitely coercion <laughs> and pressure. And there's also the strategy that a lot of churches take of just fill all of their time and then they aren't dealing with anybody outside, right? Like there are churches that have activities every day of the week. Or they encourage so, you two people with you to everything so that you can right and doctrinating everybody else exactly that's i mean that's the only pr- reason that you're supposed to have contact with anybody outside the church really is to proselytize them um which and because of that we all grow up thinking that because it's our normal 
that that's okay and that's how it has to be and how it's supposed to be. And so it is like running face first into a wall when you realize, fuck, it doesn't have to be like this. <laughs> and then it gets kind of exciting because you're like, oh my God, it doesn't have to be like this. <laughs> it's a whole new world. Right? <laughs> it, it is amazing how like you're, you're saying that they take up all of your time. Like there's the, I went home, I was homeschooled until second semester of ninth grade and all of my curriculum was Christian based. So I don't know how you cram Jesus into multiplication, but they, they did it. They did because, it. because Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes and that's your <laughs> word problem. <laughs> it's bananas. <laughs> It's surreal to me to think about how normal that seemed at one time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's, that's, that's a real mind bug. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. But you know what? I am so glad that you're making these realizations now because you're still young and your kids are little. Like, it's just, you make a whole, you know, a whole different life for them than it would have been <laughs> if you were still continuing those patterns. So you mentioned your partner. Can we talk about that? Just, yeah. I mean, not specifically her, but yeah. so there seems to be this thing that happens when we all leave. We talked about this with, um, with her too on the other episodes is we all seem to end up some sort of heathen poly <laughs> Like, we're all non-monogamous heathens now. I don't know how this happens, but that's where we all seem to end up. <laughs> the natural progression. <laughs> I think so. Well, I think once we, once we get rid of that indoctrination, then we can recognize that there's no real reason for compulsory monogamy. Yeah. So how did you, was that a hard process for you to wrap your head around that? So for legal reasons, I'm not going to delve too far into everything. Fair enough. However, my mindset has dramatically changed. Um, marriage, the entire institution is just tear jerkingly awful. Um, it turns I, people never, into property. Why are we again. still opting into that? Yeah, I'm never going to do it again because, and I'm not going to be one of those people that just says it like, no, if I'm going to be with someone, it's because we are wanting and choosing to be together, not because there's obligation and legality and mm -hmm. property. No, we're going to be two individuals that choose to be together. Um, as far as non-monogamy i haven't crossed that bridge yet however my brain does tend to think about the concepts and i still very much give myself to people you know friends and family members and my partner um so i i don't know if don't know if that's something that I'll explore in the future, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely rattling around in my brain. <laughs> I think Summer was probably the first person that, uh, honestly. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I, like, even still through, like, college, I was still, like, thinking that I was still, like, a Christian, and then, like, I slowly just kept, like, falling more out of it, and then when I met you, I was, like, my mind is blown. Everything is new and wrong, and I've been lied to. <laughs> so. I had no idea you had that reaction. Summer made me the key I am today. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Much happier than I was then, so. And, and the funny part, what's blowing my mind about this is we were working together. So she got office, you know, on my best behavior summer. <laughs> and that's, I still did this. I don't know how that that's happened. not a thing, okay? You think that that's a thing, but that's 
Office best behavior summer is not actually a person. You're very much <laughs> a person, but with less cussing. So. Or I say it at a lower volume, at least. That's the one. <laughs> Instead of like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate it. <laughs> Even though Summer and I have never had a like super, super close relationship, I have always remembered every time that we've been around each other her being happier and feeling more free than almost anybody else in my life. Kind of maybe bar my aunt Corey, but like there's just that, that feeling of like not having any real restraints. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I, I stopped giving a fuck a long time ago. <laughs> That's truly what it was. And poor Corey, she had to listen to some of that, you know, meltdowns through that process, too. And she had no idea what to say. She was just like, here, there. <laughs> like, I'll yeah. give you a hug. <laughs> long distance hugs. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because, <laughs> well, because, you know, I got um, with husband when I was 16, you know, and we were together for 13 years. So what happens when you get into, you know, a serious monogamous relationship, you stop developing socially, um, which is what the churches tell you, you they want you to do, but... Um, so when you get out of that relationship, you're still fucking 16. So here I was at 30 trying to figure out stuff that normal people got to figure out at 16 and 17. You know, just how to deal with people. Hmm? You used an N word in there that I didn't understand. <laughs> normal? <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. Normal is probably the wrong word, but typical <laughs> people, most people who aren't born into a uh, decentralized cult <laughs> get to go through normal developmental processes, I guess. There, I use that word again. I, I can't stop. More typical. <laughs> there you go. Typical. More typical. <laughs> yeah. So she was like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I don't know either. <laughs> Yeah, but I guess I figured it out. I don't know. There's definitely not a formula for breaking the mindset and the habits and the thought processes. It's every day there's either a little realization or some really huge one that shatters your entire perception of reality. <laughs> I still catch myself. Like, it's been, what, like, three four years since I've known summer now and I still like sometimes catch myself like thinking that way and I'm like what would summer do in this situation <laughs> I oh, like that I like that she <laughs> now marks time before summer <laughs> and after summer <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like a whole different life now. <laughs> Is this a phenomenon? Are there other people that I've had this effect off? Like, I need to know. You are a human prophet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> does that give me, like, a sweet and hell? How does this work? Maybe, like, a um, <laughs> with front row parking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, are you thinking about that one? <laughs> we're gonna start our commune y'all you're so open and like honest and like upfront with how you do things and you don't like yeah. sure things and it's really like eye-opening so. but somehow she's able to do it in a way that like is non-offensive yes. most people who are that blunt are usually have a little bit of offensive like most of the time hers is like you don't feel a way about it it's just that's how it is you're more like have you actually like thought about that or like researched it and like, oh i haven't actually 
research to do it. And then you come back and you're like, oh my God, Summer, you were right. <laughs> how it goes it's the process i do ask a lot of questions i do i do ask a lot of <laughs> questions too encourage people to think about things rather than telling them what i think <laughs> they should think about things because you know they may not they may not reach the same conclusion i have but i feel better about it if they've actually thought about it instead of just going off of what they were indoctrinated to wait a minute this sounds familiar, like there should be the entirety of the adults in our country doing that for something big that happens every four years. Hmm. Right. What would that be? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Summer, just uh, teach a class to everybody. Do what? <laughs> so just teach a class to everybody on how to like research and things for themselves. I mean, I could, I would. I mean, that's part of what my business is, is I provide research assistance and help to help people learn how to research things. So if people need a consultant for that, I can help them. <laughs> I just wish, I just wish people would think for themselves. But. You know, they, they say don't they, list, like they don't want to go ahead. Uh, they, they say that they like that in college for you to think for yourself. But my college experience both times before and after the military has been they don't actually like you to think for yourself. They like you to be able to put pieces of puzzles together that don't fit together to prove some to prove their point. See, I've had both experiences like I had some instructors and professors that really that's what they wanted was for you to think for yourself and they didn't care if they disagreed. I had some that were very much the opposite. I um, got a D on a con law a test in law school because um, my Catholic law professor mm -hmm. did not like my um, essay on, you know, because the, the hypothetical was um, about gay marriage and this was before the Supreme Court decision. And I am vindicated because the Supreme Court hit every point that I did, but they won't go retroactively change those grades. <laughs> but he didn't like my conclusions, so he, he damn near failed me on that exam. And I refused, I refused to because i had to go conference with him because it, when you're 1l if you get a low grade you have to go talk to your professor and i'm like uh i hear what you're saying but i still think you're wrong <laughs> that's fair i feel like i'm sure you guys have heard at some point in your lives that um silly saying that like the difference between people with tattoos and people without tattoos is that the people with tattoos don't care if you're tattooed or not i feel like that's kind of uh. this this collective of people that we are in, the people that have broken free of this organized cults and, and things like that, is we don't really care what you believe as long as you're not spewing it, making right. people miserable because they don't believe it. I think that's a good point because I don't care what people believe. As I think you have the right to believe whatever you want to believe so long as you aren't harming other people. Like just be a kind person, like right. Oh, we're out. That's all we want. Be kind. Mm -hmm. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of what the churches I grew up with do is harmful. So. Yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. I've yeah. been listening. I, I listen to audio books because I don't. I've just finally accepted that I don't ever have time to actually sit and physically read something. So <laughs> I listen to it while I drive and what have you, that fly is still flying around here. Um, <laughs> and so I've, I've been listening to books from survivors from the FLDS called the Fundamental, Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, um, Warren Jeff's group for people who know who that is. Um, but 
the most disturbing part is realizing how they may be a little bit more extreme on certain points, but the fundamental beliefs are all the same as every evangelical doctrine that I know of. So it's interesting when we watch these evangelical churches, you know, condemn these groups and all of that. But I'm like, but you're teaching the same thing, just more polite. So we're back to the polite genocide idea, right? Like you're still harming people just because you, you know, are doing it a little bit more nicely doesn't stop the arterial bleed. Yeah. I think that's like, if you just look at what we know of human history, anytime somebody believes something that's not provable, eventually it it goes down that path of either being a victim of violence or being the aggressor. Like that just that it's a pattern that you can trace back over and over and over again. That's a good point. I mean, anytime you have to have an entire field of study, such as apologetics, to be able to argue and explain the inconsistencies and contradictions within your own belief system, <laughs> you might want to rethink the book club. Yeah. <laughs> Find a new book. I don't know what book it should be, but. Um. I vote The Giving Tree. That's a, that's a pretty good book to me. Maybe one of Dr. Harper's books. <laughs> yes. Start right there. That's where everybody needs to start with Unfuck Your Brain. Yes. And mm -hmm. see that fly. And, and then, then Boundaries. Yes. <laughs> yes, because I think that those things made a world of difference for me. Um, because you do, when you're trying to deconstruct, you may not believe those the indoctrination anymore but you get sucked back in until you can set those boundaries with the families and some and for some people those boundaries have to be no contact even you know depending on their situation yeah and so you do get sucked back in and it took me a long time um, and then that kind of makes you miserable and i say kind of like it's you know only partially it makes you fucking miserable um, and so I do think things like learning Faith's books and talking to Faith, because she's very much the same way about very direct. I think that's a Choctaw woman thing, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, really? Is, 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 is that really how that works? And I'm like, okay, fine, <laughs> it's not, you know? And so she challenges me sometimes on things and but yeah, learning how to set those boundaries and also goes back to that whole idea of bad kid. <laughs> you know, when you're raised that way, you don't have any value. In fact, we're, fuck we're told we don't have any value, right? Like the doctrine of original sin says we are bad and we cannot ever have value save what Jesus does, right? So you don't have value to, you know, you don't feel entitled to boundaries. You don't feel entitled to safety or anything. And then you and have so, to, this is my house and you just like, yes. you're just like here. And so it's just, it keeps getting like worse and worse. And like, none of those are yours. They're all my things and you're borrowing them. Oh my God. I caught myself saying that the other day and I didn't mean it in that way. But I guess because I heard those words that way mm -hmm. so so often, like it just came out and I'm like, no, that's not, that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> I had to back up because it, was like, it just comes out. Yeah. I had to talk with my mom about that the other day. <laughs> How did that she, go? She, um, she tried to do that to me like a long time, like a long time as a kid. And I told her like, it still really fucked me up. Like, and so we 
talked about it, it went well on top of like you know coming out to my mother so that was weird how did that go it went good surprisingly she she was like i always thought you were gay and i was like what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> so, it went fine. my parents pretend to not know my mom was very excited she does not know what the word pansexual means uh not fair had to explain that to her and she googled it and then she texted me and said i finally learned what it means it means i am attracted to cookware <laughs> cast iron is my preference um <laughs> yeah my parents pretend they don't know they met one time they met i at the time i was seeing a couple and they met the woman and after that they just kind of pretend Oh yeah, that was your friend, and we just don't talk about it. And <laughs> they just pretend they don't know. <laughs> Dad finally reached the point where he, um, he still has the rule like I can't bring a partner there and sleep in the same bed with them, which is bizarre to me, but whatever. Um, I'm like, fine, I just won't stay here. Right? Like, I'm, <laughs> but he finally reached the point where one day he was like, Summer, I don't know how many men you have in your life. Notice he specifically said men. <laughs> this was after the woman. He's, like I said, pretending he doesn't know that. Um, I don't know how many men you have in your life. And please, God, don't tell me. <laughs> just promise me you won't get married again and no more babies. <laughs> Deal and deal. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I, I, I'm like I can't argue with that. I, I can live with that because I wasn't planning on doing either one of those things ever again. But <laughs> then he made a joke a couple days ago. He was, um, he was watching that Andy Griffith show because it's it's over there, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this episode where Barney's like trying to tell Andy, like, you need to, they, they think yeah, he's dating somebody. And he's like, no, you have to check it out. You can't just let, let a woman. And he's like, she's a grown woman. She'll be fine. He's like, no, you have to know who she's spending time with and that it's safe and all this. And he popped off, like, do I need to check out, uh, do I need to check out your man? I said, do you really want to know when I'm with, with this one and when I'm with that one? He's like, nope, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of years conditioning them by d deliberately telling them things I knew would mortify them to kind of desensitize <laughs> them. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do the exact opposite and don't tell them anything. <laughs> well, I tried that for a long time. I, and, I, and it worked for a long time. But then we ended up in situations where, like, I needed their help. Like, you know. I went to law school and my kid's dad decided to just drop them off at my parents' house and not come back for them. So I needed their help. So we had to shift gears and find a way to establish boundaries. And that is how we ended up having the conversation about how some of the things they did to me was abusive and how they aren't allowed to touch my children like that. That was a fun one. Well, you turned out okay. Did I? Did I really? Because I have a wealth of evidence to the contrary. I think yep. your definition of a fun conversation is different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, it's fun. <laughs> you know, kind of like setting your clothes on fire while you're still wearing them. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to make sure you don't miss any of the uploads, be sure to turn on those notifications so you, uh, you will know as soon as those go up. And also like us on social media at Hypoxia Podcast. Or uh, the easiest way is to go to our website, hypoxia.com. That's H-O-P-O-K-S-I-A.com. 
and the links to all the socials and all the podcast feeds are right there. And we just want to thank you all for sharing your time with us, hanging out with us, and we hope to um, spend more time with you in the future.